how dark is this academia gonna go? The problem with dark academia is actually the key theme which I think the book explores. <gasps> Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today we're going to be doing a reading vlog, however it's going to be slightly different than normal. Today I'm going to be taking a bit more of an analysis angle with this vlog because we're going to be looking at the dark academia aesthetic. I've made a few videos around or themed by this aesthetic before but today I wanted to really do a deep dive into dark academia and I wanted to read the quintessential dark academia book which is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. However before we get into it I just wanted to thank the sponsor of this video which is Ana Luisa. Now Ana Luisa is a lovely ethical sustainable jewelry company that I've spoken about quite a bit before. I really really love their jewelry. I love stacking the pieces together. I particularly love their rings. I just think they're so pretty and lovely and you can stack them together and they just look very dainty and beautiful. Ana Luisa's jewelry is such nice quality. I love that it doesn't break and it doesn't tarnish. They care very much about sustainability they are carbon neutral, they make everything in small batches to reduce wastage, they use recycled materials, but also for beautiful good quality jewelry that lasts a very long time and doesn't tarnish, it's also quite affordable as well. And that's even more the case at the moment because they're currently having their biggest sale of the year, which is buy one, get one 60% off. So if you're in the market for some lovely, sustainable, high quality jewelry that is beautifully designed and honestly just the loveliest, I wear these pieces all the time, I love them so much, please feel free to to click the link in the description down below. Now before we jump into the reading vlog section of this video, what is Dark Academia? This video is probably very late to the game, you guys have almost definitely heard of Dark Academia before, but if you haven't, Dark Academia is a prevalent internet aesthetic? It's a prevalent aesthetic that has sort of become popular on TikTok and like Instagram Reels and Pinterest. It is an aesthetic that sort of embodies the idealized image of what it would be like to be a literature or classic student at an elite university. Now this aesthetic has been around for a very very long time but it rose to popularity under the name of Dark Academia mostly over the last two years basically coinciding with the pandemic and the recent rise of TikTok. The image of Dark Academia and the clothing associated with this aesthetic can sort of be categorized by dark colors, beige blouses. This is my attempt at a Dark Academia outfit. Films popularly associated with Dark Academia include The Poet Society, Kill Your Darlings, Tolkien, there's so many books associated with this and other associations with this aesthetic include going to the museum, particularly old museums, writing with fountain pens and drawing from ink pots, uh, reading classical literature. One of the reasons why this aesthetic probably rose to prominence during the pandemic is because the pandemic itself caused so many students to not be able to go to class and therefore miss out on the sort of like idealized college or university experiences that they'd always hoped they had. One of the things just straight off the bat that I sort of find annoying annoying with the discourse surrounding the rise of dark academia and cottagecore is this sort of ideology that aesthetics are a thing that TikTok invented and that they're a recent phenomenon? That is not the case because the dark academia aesthetic has been around for a really really long time and I know this because this is basically how I would categorize my Tumblr circa 2012-ish. So why do I want to read The Secret History by Donna Tartt? This book is supposed to be the quintessential dark academia book. It's supposed to be the book that kind of informs and shaped this aesthetic. The book was published in 1992 and Donna Tartt honestly seems like the most interesting and cool person ever. Ever since I was a little girl I um, always loved to read books and I thought what a wonderful thing if I could just read books all day but writing is even more wonderful because it's a deeper level of involvement. You know when you're reading a book you're very caught up in it. She's like super duper mysterious. She publishes a book every 10 years and then just disappears completely in between. It took her eight years to write The Secret History and in roughly the 30 years it's been since it was published. It has now become a cult classic and also again the book that has largely inspired the dark academia aesthetic. So in this vlog I'm going to be telling you guys my thoughts on The Secret History by Donna Tartt, um, the dark academia aesthetic and sort of giving my overall opinion on the aesthetic after having read The Secret History. I'm just about to leave to go ahead 
to the bookshop to get my copy of The Secret History by Donna Tartt. However, my two closest bookshops do not have The Secret History in stock, I've already checked, which means that I need to trek a bit farther, quite a bit farther to go to another bookshop where I'm pretty sure they have the book in stock. If they don't have it in stock, I'm gonna be super duper sad because there's not that many more bookshops very close to me anyway. That's not the issue. The issue is that it's about to bucket down with rain. So I'm like, is this a bad idea to be going out today to get this book? But it's like a very large book. So I feel like I need to start reading it as soon as possible. The clouds look very angry. Raincoat is on, umbrella is acquired. Fingers crossed this is not a terrible idea. I have now picked up this book. I've read about 30 pages so far. The reason I hadn't picked it up just yet is because I was reading The Song of Achilles. Oh my God, that book is just, it's just, it's so, so beautiful. But anyway, I've now started reading this book and I'm up to about page 30-ish. The writing style is very, very beautiful. The imagery in this book, we have our main character whose name is Richard. He is in his late teens, he's a college student and he ends up getting a scholarship and transferring to an elite New England college where he's going to start studying the classics. So under the influence of their charismatic classics professor, a group of clever eccentric misfits discover a way of thinking and living that is a world away from the humdrum existence of their contemporaries. But when they go beyond the boundaries of normal morality, their lives are changed profoundly and forever. So Richard is the narrator of the story and so far it is told from his perspective entirely. He tries to get into the Greek class of Julian Morrow, who is this lecturer who seems very eccentric and elitist. And initially he asks to join the Greek class, but Julian, the professor turns him down and so Richard sort of views from afar these like five students who are taking ancient Greek. The imagery really is what's sticking out to me like it's really really beautifully written and so on page 19 there's a bit where Richard is sitting in the library and he can see the students. The bottles of ink I remember particularly because I was very charmed by them by the long straight black pens which look incredibly archaic and troublesome. Charles is wearing a white tennis sweater, Camilla a sundress with a sailor collar, Bunny's tweed jacket was slung across the back of his chair, he was leaning on his elbows and so the students are essentially trying to get through this passage of Greek and they can't work it out and Richard who has previously studied Greek makes a suggestion and with that he's sort of allowed to join the group. The classroom I think is described so so beautifully. It was a beautiful room not an office at all and much bigger than it looked from the outside airy and white with a high ceiling and a breeze fluttering in the starched curtains. In the corner near a low bookshelf was a big round table littered with teapots and Greek books and there were flowers everywhere roses and carnations and anemones on his desk on the table in the windowsills. The roses were especially fragrant, their smell hung rich and heavy in the air, mingled with the smell of bergamot and black china tea and a faint inky scent of camphor. That passage of imagery is just so beautiful and it's so decadent and I love it very, very much. So I just read this passage on page 34, which I think might be a bit of an indication of some of the themes of the book. So this bit is talking about Julian, the professor and his classes. There were very small classes and beside no classroom could have approached it in terms of comfort or privacy. He had a theory that pupils learn better in a pleasant non-scholastic atmosphere and that luxurious hothouse of a room, flowers everywhere in the dead of winter, was some sort of platonic microcosm of what he thought a schoolroom should be. Work, he said to me once, astonished when I referred to our classroom activities as such. Do you really think that what we do is work? What else should I call it? I should call it the most glorious kind of play. And so this teacher is like basically taking over like the whole of Richard's education at the college and he doesn't view academia as work in any sense he views it as play as like luxury and so Richard who has a like working class to lower middle upbringing <laughs> his sort of backstory very much contrasts with this idea and so I'm wondering if this book is going to explore the sort of theme of like elite education being like a luxury thing and being for you know the sake of itself and not a means to an end like not to join the labor force and to work a job and to have to earn an income and all those like mundane things that normal people have to go through. I pretty much just passed page 100 on this book and honestly, I'm starting to get a bit creeped out 
by these kids. And I, I, I know they're like college students. They're not children. I think they're like 19 or 20 years old, but I'm, I'm starting to, to get to a point where, where they're creeping me out just a little bit. The main character, Richard, is just starting to notice some things about them that maybe seem a bit off. So it's getting just a little bit more creepy. I'm taking a break from work just now. I just made my lunch. I made a burrito bowl. This isn't in any way dark academia themed, but I thought it looked aesthetically pleasing. So I'm gonna be eating my lunch now, but I just started reading The Secret History. Again, I'm at page 182 at this point. So I'm like this far of the way through the story. And it's gotten to the point where like weird shit is starting to happen. And I'm starting to question how dark is this academia gonna go? <laughs> because Richard has just sort of found out some new things that the other students have been doing and it's a little bit weird. Um, so I'm interested to see how how deep that's gonna go. Before this point, maybe at like page 130 to 150-ish, I was sort of getting a little bit annoyed by Richard because I thought that he didn't really have enough agency, but it seems like he's taking more of an active role in the plot now, which is good. So I think that's gonna be okay. But I'm gonna stop babbling at this point, eat my lunch and keep reading. <laughs> I feel like I've gotten through quite a bit of the book at this point. I'm up to page 468 currently. I am this far of the way through the story. And sort of at this point of the book, I feel like it's dragging just a little bit. Like I, I sort of felt that the pacing of the story has been really, really good the whole way through. But we're now at a point in the story where all of the main things that I thought were going to happen in the book, like things that were foreshadowed and, and things that were revealed by the blurb and stuff like that have all already happened. And so I'm sort of like waiting to see the outcomes of things. On the one hand, that could just be that I'm like kind of starting to lose interest. But on the other hand, it could be that like we're waiting for something else to happen and that this is the sort of calm bit before the next shocking thing happens. But yeah, otherwise I'm still really, really enjoying the book. I think I'm on track to finish this in the next few days. <laughs> Wednesday everyone. I at this stage have only like a hundred pages left of The Secret History by Donna Tartt. So just a small fragment. I think I can get through this in the next hour or so hopefully. I'm sort of at this point in the story where I feel still like it's just dragging a bit, like I'm waiting for something impactful to happen. I kind of feel like I'm in the denouement of the story which is the bit after the climax, so like the wrap up of the story, but I'm still waiting for one more dark or horrific or twisty thing to happen. I kind of hope that that something else happens in the ending of this story and that's going to really solidify this as like a five star book for me. The big important thing happened and then we've sort of just been like holding on for a bit too long. So I'm hoping something else twisty happens at the end. Let's get reading and we can finish The Secret History by Donna Tartt and get through the last little bit. Okay so right now I'm up to page 553. No sorry 533 of 606 pages, so not that much more to go. There's a second Patroclus and Achilles reference here, and there was one earlier in the book, and I just finished reading the Song of Achilles, so I'm really glad <laughs> that I read that before reading this. 
<laughs> I feel so dead inside. <laughs> Gee whiz. That is, that is a good book. It's a very, very good book. I'm going to message my friend whose favorite book this is and tell her I finished reading it. I feel like I need some time to compose my thoughts before I tell you guys my feelings. I think, let me, let me bring the camera closer. Oh my God. Okay. So my like immediate reaction to this book is just, it is such an epic story. It's enormous. How many words is it? 167,000 words. So it is a sizable book and I managed to read it in like four or five days ish. I think it was coming out of this book. I feel just sad and empty, but I, I thought this was a really beautifully told story. The imagery here is really, really beautiful. And I can definitely see why this was sort of the pillar for dark academia, like why this book kind of started off the aesthetic. In this book, Richard sort of embodies like the everyday person. There are so many beautiful quotes here, particularly at the end that I felt like really embodied the crux of the story. So I'm going to come back to you with my like final thoughts once I've had some time to digest this story and, and, and just, I kind of have the same feeling that I had when I finished reading Norwegian Wood. It's just that hollow, like dead inside feeling of what do I do now? <laughs> I just feel kind of sad. Um, yeah. Okay. My immediate reaction is the book was very, very, very good. I think it's five stars, but I'm going to go uh, do something else for a while. So it is the next day. First of all, my thoughts on the book itself. I think it is definitely worth the hype. I think it is worth being a five star book. I think it is worth being the cult classic that it is. I think the story is beautifully written. I think the character arcs are really convincing for all of the characters, particularly for Richard, our main character. I loved how everyone had nuance. Every single character had good parts and bad parts. Anyway, this was a five star book for me in the end. I thought it was genuinely just brilliant and beautifully written and I wanna go read Donna Tartt's other books now. So getting into my notes for Dark Academia and, and, and what I thought about the book from a critical lens. The problem with Dark Academia, there are a lot of problems you could pick apart with this aesthetic that a lot of other people have gone into in-depthly in other video essays. Some of these include the lack of representations of people of color in major Dark Academia works, such as films and books. Another problem with Dark Academia as an aesthetic is that some people believe that it encourages overwork and burnout and unnecessary and unhealthy study habits. But what I want to talk about in terms of the problem with dark academia is actually the key theme which I think the book explores. And so that makes this a little bit ironic and I find it quite funny. So my experience of university ended up being more of a utilitarian one. I've spoken about this before on my channel, the fact that I started off at uni wanting to study English literature. I think my double major I wanted was going to be English and anthropology. But because of where I live, because of the unemployment rate of where I live and, and me trying to be a realistic human being, the fact that I was financially responsible for myself and the fact that I acknowledged that I did not want to work in retail forever, I ended up transferring to a commerce degree specializing in marketing. But I also went into university sort of wanting this like romanticized experience of uni. But once I actually got into uni, that dream was kind of shattered because I spent most of my time working at my retail job and commuting to and from the university because I lived in my second and third year about an hour away. And then when I went on to do my postgrad in English literature and writing, I had decided I wanted to move to Japan. And so I did it online at a Melbourne based university. And so I never ever traveled to my campus. I didn't even attend my graduation. This book really, really struck a chord with me in the same way that this aesthetic has really struck a chord with me because it was definitely the image I had of universities and studying English, which was sort of desperately shattered when I got in. But that honestly is a much, much more realistic and normal experience of university. Most of us are going to university as a means to an end. We're going there to like get a piece of paper so that we can have a job and a stable income. There's only a small minority of people who are going to university just for the joy and decadence of studying something like the classics. And so in this book, I believe that Julian Morrow, the professor really represents and manifests 
this idea of like the decadence of studying and then Richard sort of embodies the everyman, the normal person who doesn't come from money, who actually struggles financially throughout the book and who is kind of indoctrinated into this world through the desire to be like these other people, these otherworldly students who he views from afar at the beginning and sees as being very, what was the phrase at the beginning of the book, like sort of charming and archaic in their behaviour, doing things like writing in fountain pen because it's beautiful, not because it's efficient. This next section is going to have spoilers for Richard's overall character arc. I'm going to be quite vague here, but if you want to know nothing about it, please feel free to skip ahead. Julian is this manifestation of the unattainable, a person who doesn't have to live in the world and experience the mundanities of everyday life. On page 559 it says, things which were odd by Julian's definition often turned out to be amusingly mundane. By his own choice he had so little contact with the outside world that he frequently considered the commonplace to be bizarre. An automatic teller machine for instance, or some new peculiarity at the supermarket, cereal shaped like vampires, or unrefrigerated yogurt sold in pop top cans. And so Julian by his own choice isn't of this world, he lives a life of decadence and studying for joy. And so Richard's overall character journey within this book is about realizing the fallacy of this, is about realizing that this facade that has been put up by Julian and these students is actually hiding something very ugly beneath it. And so Richard by the end of the book realizes that Julian and by extension this whole entire world that's been created actually isn't as beautiful as he once thought. And this I think is best exemplified by page 573. But the twinkle in Julian's eye as I looked at him now was mechanical and dead. It was as if the charming theatrical curtain had dropped away and I saw him for the first time as he really was. Not the benign old sage, the indulgent and protective good parent of my dreams, but ambiguous, a moral neutral whose beguiling trappings concealed a being watchful, capricious, and heartless. And then again on page 575, it has always been hard for me to talk about Julian without romanticizing him. In many ways, I loved him the most of all, and it is with him I am the most tempered to embroider, to flatter, to basically reinvent. And so we see that perhaps even within the narration of the story, Richard hasn't been entirely honest. So we know by the end of the book that his character arc is about realizing the lie of this. And then another quote from the book that I really love, which I think also embodies this, Beauty is rarely soft or consolatory, quite the contrary, genuine beauty is always quite alarming. And so I think the overall meaning of this story is to be critical of the things that are romanticized and to be critical of the things that we are taught to believe are incredibly beautiful. I really love the duality in this book, the idea that that which is truly beautiful is also in a way extremely ugly. And so the problem with Dark Academia, the desperate irony of this, is the fact that Dark Academia is an aesthetic. It's about romanticizing things that we find beautiful, using clothes and props and music to create these collages of images that sort of speak to each other and form this overall theme across TikTok and Instagram reels and, and Pinterest collages. Despite the fact that this book kicked off this aesthetic, this book in some strange, ironic and kind of foreshadowy way, also criticizes this aesthetic as looking at things on the surface level. You cannot have things that are beautiful without them in some ways being macabre and ugly and violent. And so I find that super interesting that this book contradicts the entire aesthetic which it birthed. And that is what you call irony. So I think the problem with Dark Academia is the sort of irony of the fact that this book directly criticizes the aesthetic which it gave birth to. However, I don't think there's anything wrong with people having fun with a type of dress and a sort of theming to their style. I think that it's been an incredibly stressful last two years. I think that we won't know what the true implications of this pandemic are going to be until many, many years in the future. It's been an incredibly stressful time. It's been quite a traumatic time for many, many people. And I think that it is a beautiful thing that people are having fun and building communities and creatively expressing themselves. In the end, I thought this was a really good book. It was a very fun read. I particularly loved the imagery in the book and the way this constructed the sort of image of the idealized academic world. And I enjoyed reading it very much. Thank you guys so very much for watching this video. I hope you liked this sort of new format, this more like like analytical format of a reading vlog. Also, please let me know if you guys want me to film a DAC Academia book recommendations video because I now have quite a few books that I think 
very securely fit into like this theme, which I would love to talk about. So let me know if that's something you guys want to see. And finally, thank you to everyone over on Patreon for supporting my channel. We have a lot of lovely bonus content over there. So if you're interested in checking out Patreon, please click the link in the description down below. Take care everyone and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.